Without further ado, I'm going to introduce our next speaker. Uh, now, Jerome de Groot is Professor of Literature and Culture at the Un is that right? That's right, Literature yeah. and Culture at the University of Manchester, and uh, he, like many people here, is a budding genealogist. So he's just started his own family tree, done his own DNA. He's in a very similar situation to a lot of us here, but Jerome has actually got a very interesting project that he's running at the University of Manchester, and he's exploring the way that the advent of DNA is actually making people reconsider their identity. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Professor Jerome de Groot. Uh, hi everyone, I'm not using my mic, um, I'm just going to use my voice, if you don't mind, if, I, if you can hear me at the back, that's fine, everyone good at the back, we're, we're just doing this. Um, yeah, so I, I don't really do much family history or genealogy, what I tend to do is um, study you as family historians and genealogists, so I'm interested in you as a kind of, um, as a group of people. Uh, I've been fascinated over the last five or six years that I've been working on you uh, to figure out how you tick uh, <laughs> and what you do and how and why you do it. Um, so yeah, uh, this is a this sort of uh, and finally bit of the day really. I'm going to introduce you to some fun things that I found out over the last five or six years uh, and particularly what I've been doing over the last year or so with this project which is called Double Helix History which is looking at the ways in which um, people are using their genetic make up of all, in all kinds of ways to understand themselves and particularly how to think about their relationship to their past and how this is transforming. So Ancestry DNA in 2012, uh, you know, you basically kind of exploded in 2012 there, thereafter. Uh, we've now got a huge kind of numbers of people in these various databases and many of whom, like you, are very, very sophisticated the users of this stuff, but many of whom are completely lost with what they're doing. Uh, and I'm kind of interested in the, the varieties of things that are going on. My, my interest in family historians is that you've all got very established and sophisticated ways of thinking about the past, and you have been doing this, many of you, for 40, 50 years. Uh, you've really worked out what you think. Um, and then suddenly this new thing comes along, this new tool, which seems to suggest all kinds of possibilities but also has all kinds of problems and, and issues associated with it. And I'm just fascinated by seeing that happen live, basically, and going and talking to people around the world and, and seeing, watching them figuring out almost daily how they will deal with this. And listening to, uh, to Johnny's talk, that kind of idea that suddenly, you know, there's all this possibility, we don't know how to read it or use it. Well, actually, there are people with great tools of great skills who are presenting new ways. Um, so, yeah, I've got this, uh, this group, this, this, uh, uh, this project, which I've been doing for a couple of years, which I'll explain a little bit about. Um, essentially, uh, we've basically been going around the world and talking to family historians uh, because often, too often in um, ac academia, particularly from the point of view of, his of history, um, family historians are to a certain extent either marginalised or kind of people assume they know what you think or you know what you do, um, I think, which is very clearly not the case uh, in my experience. So what I've done is rather than sort of say, well, this is what I think about this, uh, we decided to go around and talk to as many people as we could just to kind of get a handle on it. What that means is that what I've got in, in this presentation is a lot of kind of undigested data, really, because everyone is different and everyone has a particular peculiar um, approach to this stuff. Uh, so I'm kind of trying to figure it out right now. Um, so yeah, the opportunity of DNA, which, uh, which is a kind of very clear uh, moment in, in the kind of last sort of seven, eight years, there's been this massive explosion Ancestry's got over, t well, is it over 10 million, is it up to 11 million yet, or are they? It's probably more like 15 million. 15 million, there you go, so even bigger. So, one of them, so it's the biggest commercial database of DNA in the world. Um, 23 and me, 4 million of my out date there. 9 million. No, I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> okay, 9 million according to say. We're talking about 24 million, to up, from, up from 14 when I wrote this slide <laughs> three months ago. Uh, so anyway, there's this massive increase in data. There's daily, there, there is increasing this surge of information. This is astonishing if you think about the amount of stuff that is in the world now about people's DNA. We're getting this, this, this increasing kind of no, no, ways of uh, sophisticated ways of reading it, as we just heard from Johnny, the ways in which we're starting to think about this stuff and understand this stuff. When I started talking with family historians about DNA maybe four or five years ago, they were mildly freaked out. Well, I would say more than mildly freaked out by this stuff. And people didn't know how to read it. They didn't know how to understand it. They didn't know how, what this stuff might mean. 
a lot of uh, family historians I talked to, particularly in Manchester where I'm from, had resisted taking tests because they assumed that this wasn't something that was for them, it wasn't very useful for them, etc., etc. Mainly because they kind of didn't have the tools to deal with this stuff. Increasing our finding that people are, and you're kind of as a community de de developing this stuff, you're working together, you're collaborating, it's quite amazing to watch. You're to the point that you are now the cutting edge of using this information in the world, basically, more, much more so than uh, quite a lot of uh, academic disciplines. M my colleagues who are historians don't know how to use any of this stuff, um, but they're historians. Um, <laughs> and, but this has also brought up many different problems. There are ethical problems that I'm going to talk about today. There are problems to do with revealing things about family, which may not be something people have necessarily anticipated. Um, so yeah, we're so this is my just see I I have done this. This is me, <laughs> uh, as my girlfriend Court says, I'm the most boring middle class white Englishman in the world. Uh, you know, you can kind of basically work out where everything's from. But there we go, that's me. Uh, so our interest in this is what? How does this change people's approaches to their family past? Does it? I've had people tell me that it's, it's irrelevant. It doesn't matter. Who cares? This is just another toy. Uh, it's just a small tool. Okay. So, but then there are people for whom this has absolutely changed their lives. Uh, what are the unforeseen consequences of this? If there were like 20 of us doing it, that's fine. But now we've got 25 million people doing it. That has a massive risk value associated with it in all kinds of ways. One of the kind of key things that's come out of the massive databases of DNA information, family gene ge genealogy uh, information online, has been uh, the rise in um, this being used by, in forensics by law enforcement, which was not something that anyone anticipated four or five years ago. When I talked to people about what was worrying them about this, they were worried about insurance companies. They weren't worried about law enforcement. Um, so what are the unforeseen consequences? And what are the kind of anxieties and what are the good things about this that have come out of it? And I've been around the world. Uh, I've been to Australia, South Korea, I've been in Japan, uh, the States, in Holland, um, and in the UK. Um, and I'm going to go to Ireland, uh, at next, well, to the south of Ireland, excuse me. Uh, in uh, a couple of months, and I'm going to Poland next month as well. So this is quite a sort of strange collection of, of countries. There is a reason for it. If you want to find out, I'll tell you. Um, but just to kind of get a kind of flavour of this around the world as much as anything, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. So the thing I'm interested in this is this kind of fear or this worry that might be about it. If you're interested in, in DNA, this is a great novel. Uh, it's by an Icelandic uh, crime fiction writer. It's published about 2000, 2001. Uh, Anador Indrithason, it's called Jar City, it's about DNA. Uh, basically it's about, oh sorry, can I just say, um, some of the stuff that I'm going to be quoting is, not, is from people. Can, if you take photos, can you not share them? Because these are, not, uh, these are people's stories and stuff, so I would rather they weren't shared online. But take, be, feel free to take photos. Um, so yeah, it's a great novel about a, disco a, a, a murderer discovering something about his father using the big DNA databases in Iceland and then going and killing his father. Um, it's, a great, <laughs> it's a great novel about the kind of detective work of, of DNA, uh, but there's also this kind of notion that it's terrifying, that there's all this data there which can be used and read into it. So I'm kind of really interested in that. Um, the opportunity of DNA is kind of good and bad. For some, people are very suspicious. I talked to people in Canberra who talked about how suspicious they were of the testing, how worried they were. Similarly, uh, in Canberra, the same city, Council of Australia. I'm a trained historian. I'm thrilled by the new source that DNA provides. So the, in the same city, in the same group, I think this was, people basically talking about this kind of these different ways that they're worried about it. In Manchester, someone told me it was like an episode of Black Mirror, which is a dystopian science fiction uh, TV series which is on Netflix, uh, which is about how, you know, horrible ways in which the world is changing. Um, and then another person, in the, I think even the same group in Manchester told me this is the golden age for family history. I have this idea that it might be the golden age. Um, so what I'm going to do today is I'm just going to go through some of the kind of uh, things that we found. Um, and at the end, what I'm hoping for um, is that you're going to share some experience with me. Because as, as I've said, I, I'm kind of a bit, you know, I, I'm not interesting. I'm interested in you guys and whether these things chime with what you worry about, with what you're thinking about, uh, whether you're kind of um, comfortable with the, some of the stuff that I'm raising, whether you don't, haven't seen some of this before. So when we, get, when we get to the end, we'll have a little bit of a chat about that. Does that sound okay with you lot? Good, okay. So, first off, why do people do this? <laughs> um, I have a range of reasons for doing this. Uh, I'm kind of presuming that in this room people were doing it for various uh, complicated reasons, but you have a kind of commitment to family history and genealogy. A lot of people I spoke with had not, and they had actually got into family history and genealogy through the DNA kits and through that route. 
Um, so that's something I think really important and interesting for you as a community to think about because this is a way in and people moan oftentimes when I talk to them about uh, you know, these people who are just getting it for, for Christmas and then putting their information up and then not making a tree and just there's no information associated with it. But this is a way in which you're kind of drawing people in and involving people in this. And um, particularly younger people actually, the people I spoke with uh, under 30, under, t under 25 doing this stuff were, had come in through DNA. They definitely were interested because of the DNA. That, that was where they got kind of hooked first. So yeah, it was something of a joke. We gave it to uh, uh, my husband and I gave each other for Christmas. They kind of you know, swapped gifts basically, um, it's, uh, because they were interested in the ethnicity issue. This person from Sydney. Um, someone came to family history society talks and had learned more as a consequence and decided to go into it. Um, from, uh, sorry, Manchester saying it, it, I have an obsession with finding out who I am, and so people are interested in all kinds of different ways. The ethnicity was, I think, people in this room might be a little bit. Uh, uh, uncomfortable maybe with the ethnicity uh, uh, ish, ish, uh, angle, the way in which particularly ancestry presents ethnic ethnicity uh, percentages, etc. This is very definitely a driver of people's involvement in this stuff. This is very definitely the reason people get involved. And of those 15 million people in that database, a great majority are interested coming from that point of view. Um, they may then get become more sophisticated, and that's more interesting maybe, but it takes them a lot, you know, it's the thing that gets them in, in, into it. Obviously, brick walls is the kind of key thing. People are bothered about their brick walls and they're really interested in breaking down their brick walls. Um, a particular family that I've been looking at for 40 years was able to match with the descendants of this person's children. Uh, for many of us, it's helped us break through a number of brick walls, particularly if you have adoptions or illegitimacy. Now, these two things are great, but they do raise ethical concerns. They do raise all kinds of problems, particularly if you're talking about re relatively close family members. And nearly everyone we spoke with was mildly terrified about the kind of uh, uh, consequences of using DNA in this way. And brick walls aren't the only reason. People are interested in uh, mystery. People are interested in just finding out about themselves. People in Holland were interested in just enriching their, 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 their insights. I know you can, you can take photos, but just don't share them. Is the, is the, uh, because these are raw, just raw, raw things that people have spoken to. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think you can probably all, you've probably all got your own particular motivations for doing these things. And I think it's important for us to have a sense of the, the, these, this broad, um, the, the, this broad uh, way that people come into it. Um, and I think this sometimes you just need to know the kind of this is being presented to us as a as a as a, a kind of catch-all. It gives people an answer. That's how it's being marketed by some of the big bigger big, um, organisations. We have to be a bit careful about that, because as we all know, that's really not what's happening here. Uh, that kind of knowledge is not necessarily being given, and in fact, it can make it much more complicated. Uh, we thought, wanted to find out why people did this, and particularly why they did it with, with, with certain companies. Because I've spent, I've spent you know, t time talking with you guys as a community, and it's become clear to me that there are differences between the tests. And I've done one, I haven't done as many as I would wish to, maybe, uh, but I'm not as much of a user. Um, but actually, I think people are very, very kind of, they, they range very widely in terms of their motivation and therefore why they do particular tests. Uh, the biggest database, Ancestry, is obviously the big one, and this is why people are so interested in doing it. Um, people, though, are interested in the kind of complexity and stuff like this. People are interested in the different kind of functionality, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and I. it's rare, I don't know about you as a group, but it's rare that you come across people who have done more than two, maybe. Uh, maybe they've done three, maybe they've done four, but it's very, very rare. People are, tend to do one or maybe two. Uh, I, I don't know whether I'm being unfair, I mean, you know more than me. But basically, we, there's a kind of brand loyalty to a certain extent. Or people are just exhausting what they're getting from their particular test in their particular um, software or whatever. Um, but then I just find people who have done nearly everything and have had you know, tests, six, you know, tests 10 years ago and 15 years ago and had an amazing amount of information. Um, one of the things that we found really was basically about the size of the database. And that actually Ancestry's, Ancestry's kind of uh, hold over the market is still so, so strong, mainly just because of the size of its, of its database, the amount of information it's got. Uh, I wouldn't have gone to Ancestry initially, uh, but it became to be bigger, so I combined that. Um, also, people come to exhibitions and conferences. Loads of people told me that they come to something like this, like we, where we are today, and it kind of signed up because, you know, why not? Because they were there and it was fun. Uh, so it really, really works. Having this kind of, uh, I mean, this event really, really works. Um, 
And yeah, basically sort of talking with friends. The, the kind of unlooked for thing, talking with volunteers here, and I haven't really explored this enough, and I'd like really, it'd be nice to know what you think. Um, the, the kind of community support, like this time of event, and then, but then also family history societies and online forum, uh, and all these kinds of organisational kind of institutions that are designed to help you do this stuff, I think has become, the, the importance and the power of those institutions has become amplified with DNA. Uh, it was formerly, you know, they were important and they would help people kind of um, get skills and they would, they would give people kind of networks and collaborative partners or whatever. But now they become really a kind of broker. They're really, really important educational institutions uh, and, and kind of uh, knowledge centres for family history. And nearly everyone I spoke with over the last two years has had some involvement with the Family History Society, which has been a, which has been a very positive experience. It's given a kind of... Um, uh, a, a set of uh, skills or a set of relationships which are really important to them. And I just think this is astonishing, the amount of kind of brilliant collaborative work that's going on. But also this kind of knowledge base that's being built up by you as a community. It's just astonishing. Um, one of the things we wanted to know is what, was what, how much people's knowledge of DNA actually was important, whether they knew anything. Johnny said earlier in his talk, you know, he wasn't very good with, with the science. I don't know anything about DNA. I literally have friends that I phone up who are geneticists and say, can you remind me, re tell me about that again? <laughs> uh, uh, but I was interested in whether this was being done taken by people who had some kind of knowledge of genetics or whether it was done cold. And I would say about 95% of people is pretty cold. Uh, they pretty much know that DNA is the building blocks of life and they've heard of Crick and Watson and that's probably it. Uh, but what actually, whether that matters or not is a different matter. So we have people saying, it's like a computer, you don't have to understand how the program works for it to be useful. I quite like that. Uh, various people saying, oh, yeah, I love this one. I think it's like magic. <laughs> uh, yeah, from a little bit of saliva here, you can find out everything you can. I don't understand anything about DNA. Now, this is maybe an unfair uh, set of uh, quotations that I've just pulled out. We did come across people who had very sophisticated scientific knowledge, but I would say about, yeah, about 90, 95% of people who we talked to, when they began this process, had very imperfect understanding of what was going on um, and are still relatively tentative about it. And you get a kind of continuum of people who are like, on the one hand, I don't care, it just works. I'm just basically doing it by, you know, by rote. I'm just learning how to do it in order to... And then you've got more sophisticated people who are more... And, th and then you've got people who had no knowledge at all but were interested in kind of learning. It's a kind of interesting range, I would say. Um, we, as I said, we went around the world. Um, not com Well, yeah, nearly sit circumnavigated. Uh, and talked to various places, various people in various places. I'm going to give you some examples of how people uh, have, have sort of thought about this in different ways across the world, in different contexts. I would say it's very much more popular in Anglophone countries, uh, particularly, uh, particularly in the US and, and in Australia and the UK. Um, I would say that uh, that is actually starting to break down because of the kind of global nature of some of these companies, but also because of things like social networks. Um, what we found out a lot about, in, um, particularly in Australia and the US, was genealogical tourism associated with DNA, particularly people coming to Europe, and, uh, and spending a lot of time coming over here. Um, so yeah, global differences. The Dutch couldn't really care less about DNA. <laughs> they did do it. <laughs> and I went to the, the NGV, which is the National Geogra Geological Society in Munich in Holland. Uh, so be quite a lot of, uh, quite a lot of um, uh, family historians there. And they, were, they had, a, to my mind, a much more uh, academic interest in, gene in, in DNA. They spent a lot of time doing various projects. They were involved in university projects. They were interested, not necessarily in autosomal, they were much more interested in uh, surname and Y chromosome. They were much more bothered about the kind of academic application of DNA testing. They weren't as bothered about the kind of um, uh, more kind of, well, they weren't interested in ethnicity at all. They weren't interested in any of that stuff. Uh, they were quite resistant, actually, to some of the major companies. What they were doing was, was kind of building their own stuff. Uh, one more tool in your research was what I was told by a, kid, a big uh, genealogist in, uh, in, the, in, in Holland. So yeah, the Dutch, yeah, they were very, very unbothered. I was quite upset. Um, you know, my, <laughs> I have a Dutch name and my, uh, my, my opa was from uh, Amsterdam and I was feeling like I had some kind of connection and they were like, no, I didn't care. Uh, however, in Australia, yeah, absolutely, absolutely going for it. The Australians really so bothered about DNA stuff. And possibly this is because it's a settler colonial context. 
uh, I would say that I use the word bigamy more than I've ever done before when I was in Australia. <laughs> I basically, everyone I talked to had a bigamous, uh, at least one or two bigamous relationships in their past. Uh, they were quite comfortable with this, the historians I talked to. Um, but obviously DNA at work allows them to kind of uncover this. Um, it's, I think, probably, I don't know enough, but it would probably be the case also um, in Canada and, and the US. And this is because of um, scale, and it's also because of colonial context being much more kind of uh, imperfectly administered, I would imagine. Uh, and also people just escaping things. Um, it's not because they're all convicts, although they're very keen about that. Uh, nowadays, Australia is very keen about having a convict ancestor. Much more complicated is the issue of indigenous DNA mm. and how this is seen in the database. Uh, it's a very complex thing about whether Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander DNA or Native American First Nations DNA, if you're in the States and Canada, how that's, how that's seen in the database, how it's been, uh, how it's been used, uh, and also how people uh, uh, in the contemporary moment talk about their relationship with these communities. Um, most, uh, well, a lot of people in, the, in Australia would have some kind of, of indigenous DNA in their, in their, um, in their background, it's, it's very common. Um, but then talking about being indigenous is a much more complicated thing. So actually in Australia and also main, in settler societies which have native um, populations, indigenous populations, it's an incredibly complex and problematic issue to talk about your DNA and your inheritance in this way. Um, this lovely quote from a lady in Canberra, yeah, they came here to make a new start and here we are digging it all up again. <laughs> uh, this kind of sort of slightly gleeful sense that <laughs> you know, you're gonna catch your ancestors out uh, <laughs> and being naughty, which they, best, they basically did a lot. <laughs> you know, because human beings are human beings. Um, in South Korea, DNA uh, and DNA testing for ancestry does not exist. Absolutely, nearly, nearly, well, there is some of it, but very, very, very little. Uh, basically, this, and the reason is this, the National Library of Korea and various of the of the other uh, genealogical uh, libraries, of which there are li li hundreds in Korea, uh, they have these which are called Jokbo. Uh, they are basically kind of uh, to every ten years, uh, a clan, a name uh, will update their family history, and so you have this very centralised, uh, very centralised genealogical uh, culture in, in Korea. Korean Korean names are essentially a clan name, a place name, this is according to male line. Uh, and then there are other kind of variations, but most Koreans uh, will, be able, will, will have this kind of assumption that their family history is in the library, and they don't really have to do anything about it. Um, and this is something that has been going on since the 16th century. It became much more uh, prevalent in the, 19th, the late 19th, and early 20th century. So Korean culture, very resistant to, to DNA testing for, for this, for various reasons. Also because the Korean culture uh, is very resistant to the, to the um, issue of uh, ethnicity. Uh, and many, many, many Koreans do not want to know their, ethnic, their ethnic background, is my understanding, basically. Uh, so, so similarly, uh, Asian Americans, uh, European Asians uh, from Korean background, also from Japanese and, uh, um, and Chinese background, resistant to finding out about their ethnic background for various reasons to do with geopolitics and history, essentially. Yeah, so this is a job, this is what they look like. Um, and this is a kind of, essentially, outlines the family history of a particular clan name back, going back, you know, they go back centuries. Uh, they're quite, amer quite amazing. It's very precise, very centralised, much less about the kind of individual finding out their family tree and their family history. So therefore the DNA kind of aspect is not really very much there. This is my favourite picture ever. Uh, this amazing woman, through an interpreter, explained uh, uh, South Korean genealogy to me, and this is what it looks like. <laughs> and I was like, after about an hour, I thought, right. And this is in a mixture of kanji script, uh, so, you know, uh, so, excuse me, uh, so the script that you're familiar with from Japanese and from uh, Mandarin Chinese, uh, and Korean script. Uh, she, she spoke th at least three languages whilst doing this. Uh, and there's a great little map of the South Korea here. Uh, anyway, it, I don't understand any of it. But I've got a recording of her doing it, but uh, it's pretty, spe pretty spectacular. So yeah, Korean uh, population, very interested in genealogy, very con con you know, as far as they're concerned, very, very sure about their family history, not as bothered about the DNA. Uh, in the States, similarly to Australia, settler communities, uh, very much more interested in ethnicity, but a massive complication about ethnicity, obviously. Uh, this is Elizabeth Warren, who's claimed to Native American uh, ancestry in the last um, sort of six weeks or thereabouts, which has been very much attacked by uh, First Nations and Amer uh, um, Native American population. 
because they say rightly, in the same way that Aboriginal peoples would or First Nations people in Canada would, that's not actually the, that's not how becoming Native American happens. Uh, you, it's part of it, possibly, uh, but actually DNA is, is being kind of re rejected by some of those communities as a marker of identity. Um, but you know, the fact that she's even making a political point by trying to claim this identity through a DNA test, I think it's pretty astonishing. Um, in the States, we found that people were more interested in this kind of sense of connectedness with using their DNA to be connected with their ancestors. Um, they're increasing a sense of self, this kind of idea that they're kind of somehow part of you. Um, yeah, quite a sweet thing. There's also, oh sorry, this is Crystal uh, Sosi, who's a, a DNA Navajo geneticist, saying, yeah, that basically, they may say that they can find out Native American information from the databases, but actually there's no, there's no tribal level specificity, no tribal nation accepts these results for enrolment, and quite a lot of the biomarkers, in her opinion, used to generate these estimates were unethically procured, and they were procured from, from, uh, from uh, populations that have bear no resemblance to, um, to Native American uh, <coughs> tribes and populations. They're from uh, Central and South America, largely. So what she's basically saying is the indigenous uh, data makes no sense. So, you know, actually it's really problematic. But, that said, the other, the other thing people are interested in, in the States is whether they're going to go back to the, um, the American Revolution or whether they go back to the Mayflower. Uh, and they use, basically, uh, the DNA to do this. The, the DNA has now added a kind of way into doing that. And it kind of gives a sheen of, um, what's the word I'm going to look for? A sheen of kind of assurance and truth to this. Where formerly people had used, the, uh, you know, the standard tools of family history. Uh, people had basically used uh, people have basically used um, DNA to really kind of underline stuff. To the point that we have two members of the Mayflower, we can't see DAR connections, I'm still claiming it for my girls. <laughs> so, so even though the DNA was actually saying to this person that they weren't related to people from the Daughters of the American Revolution, uh, they were still claiming it. Uh, and I kind of love that. There's lots of instances of people basically getting their DNA information and basically ignoring what it tells them. <laughs> and saying, well, I'm still Viking, I don't care. Or, or whatever, you know, or, or, you know we're still go we can still go back to 1780 or whatever. Uh, anyway. Um, what else did we get? We got problems, we got worries, and this is the kind of major ethical issue that I would say. Uh, skeletons in cupboards. Have we got the right to reveal ancestors' secrets? It's overwhelming. Uh, and this, th what people were finding was that they were suddenly discovering that they had to deal with the consequence of this stuff in the contemporary moment. That when they had formerly been working on archives that were, you know, 200 years old, that suddenly they were discovering stuff, that having put their DNA into the database, which they were not comfortable with. Um, where there's a will, there's an argument. My grandmother has a stepson thinking that she's going to split the money between people. Um, and between us, a uh, person we talked to in... I mean, I'm dumb, this is not between us, is it? <laughs> uh, someone we spoke with in one of the cities in Australia uh, had discovered that she had a new cousin uh, who was uh, possibly in, in line to inherit the massive estate that her uncle had died and left right about a month before she found this out. Uh, and she was very, very bothered about the kind of ethical uh, issues or the ethical consequences of this, how she was going to deal with this. Um, obviously, you will all come across you know, the, the various phenomena of people discovering that their parents aren't their parents or their grandparents aren't their par grandparents. Um, and the problem is, that, as people were pointing out, if, if you're in the database, then you can't get away from the database to a certain extent. There's umpteen other people who can let the cat out of the bag somewhere. Quite a lot of family historians talked about how ethically worrying they, how worried they were about having information which might then be found out by other people that they were no longer necessarily in control with, control of, and that this information, which formerly had been just, you know, the archive that you all work on and that's nice, was suddenly maybe having consequences um, in the contemporary world in the now, and this is really quite quite problematic. There's a massive responsibility, people said, and actually someone in Melbourne said this. I I think twice now about having it done. Are you prepared? And we had that quite a lot from people who had, had, uh, who had found revelatory things and they were quite yeah. excited about the revelatory things, maybe not happy about them, uh, but they would maybe have thought twice before going through this again. Um, particularly things like adoption. People discovered things about adoption. People discovered information about adoption. It's a cottage industry, people said, discovering, uh, but also using this. And obviously, it's a very, very positive thing. It's a very positive thing that you can use this in cases of adoption. You can help people out. Uh, at the same time, this is raising issues about whether you should, whether you could, you know, whether it's uh, you should be able to do this, whether people should be forgotten, whether people's uh, right to be uh, not part of the adoption conversation should be allowed, should be part of it. So this is 
forcing people to have quite complex ethical conversations with themselves about their data, which they formerly had not had to deal with, um, I would say. So DNA is really pushing it. Um, DNA really helps. I got into really, my mother was adopted. We never knew anybody in her family, not from mothers. We finally got a little bit. So basically, it is a, it's another adoption brick wall. It does make a lot of difference to people. But at the same time, it can also be quite problematic because, I'm not going to go through that because it's too long, you also then have the issue which came up a lot in Australia about sperm donation. And again, this is about the contemporary moment. that people are really worried about finding out about a sperm donor. So my husband found a child, was an IVF sperm donor. That was difficult. And the laws for sperm donation, the laws about revealing the anonymity of, of donors, change across states in Australia. They change across states in the US. They change across nations. They change across, you know, in the UK. Uh, it would be different to Ireland. It would be different to across Europe, etc. Um, so, yeah, sperm donors found uh, children they were meant to be anonymous. Um, and it was very problematic. And suddenly you've got people who are suddenly finding um, sperm donors in their background. They're finding adoptees in their background. Uh, my cousin is biologically from sperm donation, not my uncle's, never been told. But with all this DNA, I'm just waiting for the, the, the day when he tests and we don't match and it's revealed. So this is someone holding on to this information and not telling their cousin this and assuming that it will come out at some point. Um, and there's a lot of this. I don't know about you, but my understanding really has been that fa the family historians see themselves oftentimes as kind of uh, keepers of the family memory. And there's a, very, there's a sort of duty to that, and it's an amazing thing, and it's a lovely thing. Um, but increasingly what DNA is doing is provoking people into hiding stuff, <laughs> because they're suddenly discovering things that they don't really feel comfortable sharing, or they're not confident about sharing, um, which, but, which is changing the way they see the, their role. And suddenly their role is slightly, slightly challenging, I would say. Um, so, to kind of uh, bring this, wrap this up a little bit, uh, what the other things that people kind of raised were, were kind of uh, things we might want to think about, as a, you might want to think about as a community over the next sort of five to ten years when this sort of really starts to get established. Because we've really only been having tests done for six, seven years. Uh, you're, you know, even though it's massively expanding, there's a kind of foundational number which is just settling, there, settling in. And as a community, you're getting better at understanding this stuff. It's becoming a hybrid. You're very clearly using it. You're very comfortable, etc., etc. What's coming up? What do people think the worrying signs are that is going to happen, the, the worries that people have? Well, the obvious one is about people's concern about what's happening to this data. Whether this is truly uh, the case or not, people were worried about Ancestry particularly uh, taking their data and selling it. Uh, they're not doing it for public good, uh, one of our uh, respondents talked about. And people were kind of divided largely, and probably in this room you'd be divided about this. On the one hand, people saw that actually they were getting a service and they were comfortable with that service. And so the payoff was that their data was going to be being used in various ways that it was going to be sold. And that was as far as they were, they were concerned, that was that. That was a kind of, that was good enough. But this guy was very angry about the fact that they sell the data that you pay them for. So what he was seeing was that actually it was much more um, uneven than that. That you would pay for this service and then it, your data would then be sold and they would make making money. Um, and I, I think that this is going to become more and more complex over the next years as, as, as these companies do seek to uh, leverage the data that they have into profit, which is kind of their, uh, their, uh, uh, what they would wish to do, and it's up to them. It's fine in some ways. Um, and how, as a community, you deal with that. It's not simply a matter of what happens about this being you know, manipulated by pharmaceutical firms or whatever, but where the data sits and how it sits into the future, how it's kept. How are you going to be able to know that this is actually something that you will be able to look at in 20, 30, 40 years' time as a group? As a group, will you be able to access this information in 100 years' time or 200 years' time? Where is it going to sit? And these kind of issues about uh, profit and about the commodification of this data, I think, really have to be resolved at this point. And also, are they going to sell my results to whom? And I think people are worried with it in a kind of mild, anxious way, not, you know, physically hor horrified, but concerned about what's going to happen next with this stuff. Um, people were particularly bothered about technical things. We've already heard about various ways of organising technical stuff, but a lot of folk were just put off by the amount of technical knowledge you needed, not just in terms of reading the data, but then keeping hold of it. So this is brilliant. I've got uh, a tech an expert on spreadsheets. I tested six people. I've got 1,300 lines of just names and ancestry. Uh, 
all kinds of things. And, and she's using all these different types of, uh, of, of tools, all these different ways of collecting stuff. But largely, she's, I mean, at the end of this, she was just like, I don't know how the stuff works. I don't know how to read it anymore. My computer is just stuffed full of files and files and files. So I think the kind of the exponential growth of information that we have is great on the one hand, but you are coming up against skill absence. And there are some people who are brilliant at this, and some people are very comfortable with this, but the majority of people really aren't. Um, so you need a very good knowledge of computers. I've become an expert on of spreadsheets. Uh, and people saying it helps if you're analytical. Everyone here use spreadsheets when they're talking about their DNA? Everyone comfortable with spreadsheets? No, we've got two people down here. <laughs> um, seriously, like the, the amount of kind of bespoke systems that people have built to do their DNA work was quite astonishing. I came across you know, many, many people who had uh, created their own spreadsheets or created their own software on you or coded this and that. All these little bits of stuff that people had used. Uh, which is lovely, but was kind of just their own thing. And you're just like, this, so much um, effort is going into this, this stuff in order to try and read this, in order to hold it. And people are kind of evolving ways, which is lovely and brilliant, but also spending, maybe wasting time because they're building stuff which is not going to be you know, usable in the future. They're building stuff which is going to uh, run out of time in this. And I've already mentioned this, but people were really bothered about what happens next. Um, there are concerns about how the, future, the, the information will be used in the future. This came uh, into kind of focus with people talking about what happens to people's DNA data when they die. And we oftentimes talk with people who manage the data of uh, parents or uh, various types of uh, or siblings even uh, who had died and they had that data. And they were able to access and use that data, but they were really concerned about the ethics of that. People talking about inheriting data. Now, you, there are some mechanisms for how this works in, in various of the software, various of the, uh, of the databases, but it is going to be a very live issue very soon, in sort of 10, 15 years' time, where this stuff is kept, how it's kept, how it's managed, how it's organised. A, a great majority of the stuff that you would do as a family historian without genetics, a great majority of the work you would do would be working on uh, records that were kept somehow by the state, somehow. They were, they were records about marriage, records about death, records about tax, about, um, about service in the military, et cetera, et cetera. And those are kept in archives, in libraries, in wherever, in all kinds of amazing places. Those things don't exist with the DNA archive. The DNA archive is, is kept uh, in some databases that are commercial, in some databases that are crowdsourced and not commercial, but there's no kind of... Uh, at this point, policy for collection for the future, for instance. So the genealogists of, 20, uh, of 2119 might struggle to get hold of your DNA data, for instance, if they wanted to. And I find that quite fascinating, but also quite challenging. Where is it going to be held? And the fact is that yeah, we, we are at the, we're really in the kind of revolutionary moment when it's like everything's white, brilliant and new, but we have to think about what happens in 100 years' time with this and where it's going to go and how, uh, how interoperable things are, how obsolete stuff might become, how spreadsheets in 20 years' time, people will, not, will be looking at them thinking, I don't know how to use these things. You know, has anyone got a floppy disk in their house, for instance? You know, computers change like that. <laughs> uh, and we're all very comfortable with the ones we've got right now, but everyone has got a, a, a drawer full of, of, of obsolete technology, of obsolete phones and things that don't read this, and memory sticks that you can't use any longer because the files are too old, or whatever. So this is just going to become even more problematic in the next 20, 30 years, I would say. So yeah, here's a good example. My mother-in-law passed away a couple of weeks ago. I've got her DNA. I'm using it like she wanted me to, but what are the ethics around it now that she's passed? And someone else said, I feel like I've inherited her DNA to look after now. And that's an amazing, lovely thing, but also there's a duty there, and it's quite, there's no obvious thing to do at that point with this inherited DNA. There's no obvious way to, to use it, really, I guess. Um, and the final thing that people did talk about a little bit were obviously this came up, this, this case came up, the Golden State Killer case came up, uh, the way that law enforcement were using, possibly using uh, the databases. It's shocking what you can discover about people from DNA and limited information. People were concerned. Um, and it's not necessarily the case that they were concerned for, for good reason, necessarily. But they were, they, they were very anxious. This, this, this case made them very anxious. Uh, and it turned something which had formerly been... Uh, an interesting hobby, a game, a puzzle, 
to, in a something which was, had real world application, which was mildly scary to people uh, and, and concerning. Um, and the other thing that concerned people the most uh, was about people just pitching up with their information and not knowing anything. And again, I sort of, I, I think this is both a kind of challenge and, oppor and an opportunity for you as a, as a community. There are millions of people in the database who have not done their family trees, who don't care about their family trees. All they want is a little ethnicity estimate because they got this thing for Christmas and they spat in a tube and they sent it off and that's all they care about. And they sit there in the database not helping or maybe helping in some ways, but you know, they're, they're not giving anything. Um, I think you can, because of the number of them, as a community, you're going to have to figure out how to use them, how to either draw them in and make them part of what you're doing um, or to work around them somehow. Uh, or, as I was saying, because they tend to be younger, to try and actually develop ways in which you can communicate with them and use their information, but also skill them in the, in the amazing things that you've been doing for the last 50, 60 years. And that's me. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks so much, Jerome. Um, blinded. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you might want to stand a little bit over here just to get out of the, the, the beam of the uh, overhead projector. Um, that, that's absolutely fascinating uh, work that you've done. And it, it's interesting to get the global perspective because uh -huh. we really only have the Irish and the British perspective from where we're standing. And of course, on the Facebook groups, we have interactions with Americans as well. Um, the whole uh, Southeast Asian uh, attitude to mm -hmm. DNA and genealogy is very, very different to what absolutely. we have here. Uh, but of course, they have tested 50 million people in China. Chinese, yeah, but <laughs> they didn't ask them. They didn't ask them. <laughs> that does raise Which is something of an ethical issue. <laughs> yeah, uh, about using people's data. Yeah, absolutely. Although, yeah. So the worry I have is that that we, that we, if you don't have a kind of understanding of the of the of the cultural differences about thinking about about genealogy and family history, then you end up imposing a way of thinking yeah. about family or kinship or yeah. and that's what is gonna happen, I would imagine, in Southeast Asia if we're not careful, because mm -hmm. the major websites are are Anglophone, they're mm -hmm. from the US. Uh, is definitely what is being fought over in um, Australia and in the US about by between indigenous groups and um, and uh, what they see as a kind of imposition of a way of thinking about family mm -hmm. uh, and about a connection to family and how this works. And so that's one of the m million, myriad issues that there are around those things. So yeah, the, the, the Southeast Asian I I example is really fascinating to me because the, in, in, uh, in China, in Japan, in South Korea, um, across bits of Southeast Asia, genealogy is really important, family is really important, but it's completely different to what you would think about it. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's differently organized and conceived of differently, and, and it's, uh, it's theological, and it has all these different things. Um, and there's a worry about kind of blundering in and going, right, I assume these things about these family groups, mm -hmm. which don't really work in that way. And DNA seems to be a way of kind of cutting through that, because it's not, it doesn't have the kind of assumptions about family that you might have from mm -hmm. the West. But equally, it then has knock-on effects for uh, identity, which many, many South Koreans wouldn't want to talk about, I would say. Nearly all of them. <laughs> the, it's, uh, are there certain, I know you're going to be visiting other countries as well to continue the research, but is there, are there certain particular countries that you would like to target because of <laughs> perhaps for historical reasons, they might be quite averse to uh, DNA testing? Uh, yeah, there are two. Well, there's one. I, I, I'm going to Poland, and the reason I'm going—I said there were reasons for this. The reason I'm going to Poland, the Southeast Asian ones, because they're interesting for that reason. The uh, Australia and the U.S. because of sort of settlerness, uh, Ireland because of kind of colonialism essentially, um, Poland because it has an incredibly elaborated uh, public culture of genealogy, but it's all about aristocracy. Uh, so you have this very kind of top-down version, as, as I understand it from my friends, uh, of, of, of it, and it's not. Yeah, Polish genealogy is um, is very kind of. I, w I think you would reckon would, would would conceive it as very inflexible and a little bit kind. Of, I'm maybe being unfair, but mm -hmm. I haven't been there yet. Mm -hmm. uh, the other places are. I, well, I want to go to Brazil, but that I mean, <laughs> because you know the DNA of Brazil, of your your standard Brazilian is cr is completely crazy, right? And that's brilliant. Mm -hmm. uh, but then you get into all kinds of issues about um, indigeneity. You get into issues about inheritance, about state, about nationhood. I'm going to Brazil right now is a little bit co crazy. Mm -hmm. And going and asking people to give you information about their identity in Brazil right now is not something you want to get involved with, really. Uh, but I've got colleagues in Brazil who have talked to me about about this, and they're just like, this is. It demonstrates how. DNA is an incredibly political issue because it's mm. about identity. Mm. Um, and we can quite happily sit in the West, uh, even though we're sitting in Belfast, and, and sort of think that this is not 
this is, might be a neutral thing somehow, and it's just about us and that. But actually, it's not. And you go around the world and you discover actually it's, it's really not a neutral thing at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have a question from this lady. Um, Hi. What, what about other European countries, for instance, uh, France and Germany? They have different perspectives. Think, Absolutely, yeah. Yet they're colonial powers, and do not people from their colonies want to know? Absolutely. I don't know because I don't have the language mainly, although I have a bit of French, but I don't have enough French to go and talk to people in Senegal about this, but I think I probably should. <laughs> absolutely. Um, and if I had more money or if I had more time, yeah, that would be where that would go. But absolutely, France and Germany, who have particularly um, uh, interesting re relationship with DNA testing yes. and a complex relationship with DNA testing. Not that no one has, I mean, everyone's had a complex one, but uh, there's a particular um, legal framework going on there, right? So. Um, I would wish to go and talk with people uh, yeah, in those former colonies and see whether they are, they have a similar thing, with a similar way of talking about it to the, as, they, as, as the Australians or the Canadians or the Americans do. Uh, that said, the, the Francophone and the German um, former colonies, to my not, I'm just thinking off the top of my head now, don't have as, a, as elaborated family history culture would I be right in saying that? Am I being... I mean, apart from Canada, I guess. Well, uh, France seems to have a, a fairly um, active... No, no, sorry, the French do, but yes. uh, the French former colonies, I mean, Algeria, um, Senegal, yes. uh, Cote d'Ivoire, I don't know whether, whether you would say that they... I mean, I don't think they have... as uh, That I would know of whether they have as elaborated um, family history culture. So is there something peculiar about the post colonial anglophone experience that wasn't the case about for the French. I'm going to go out on a limb and say yes, but I don't know why. <laughs> uh, I, but yeah, absolutely, I'd like to think about that. That's a brilliant idea. Uh, which, and again, not something I conceive of, so thank you. That's a great idea. And I, th I think, I'm sure one of the geneticists would uh, know better than I do, but I think isn't there some legal um, thing about genetic testing in France that you're... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. In, Fr in, Fr in France and in Germany, am I right? You can't. You, you, it was until quite recently the case that you couldn't do commercial. They, they, they banned uh, paternity testing. Paternity testing. Yeah. yeah. So there was legal. To protect the families. Yeah. So there were legal issues about paternity testing. But how, does that, as I understand I mean, it, I mean, still, um, some of the companies will sell DNA tests in France, and it's fine. Mm. And that's it's, we just right. in Germany very recently. But only, yes, only, yes, only very recently, isn't it? Yeah. Isn't it? And, yeah. and I think because yeah. of yeah. Yeah. because of yeah. German yeah. political yeah. history, yeah. there are issues about digging up your past in a particular way using DNA and I think they've been very careful going to France and Germany for those reasons uh, and because yeah for the French legal system is is has a, a raised eyebrow <laughs> yeah. yeah and so in Switzerland where you are able to do this there, there are all kinds of clinics on there on the Swiss French border where people just go over and get their paternity tested and there's this kind of cottage industry of paternity testing um, because you can't do it in France Yes, the French law dates to 1995. Actually, goes back that that yeah. that uh, far, um, but they have been doing gen uh, DNA testing in France for mm -hmm. quite some time. Uh, Family Tree DNA's uh, affiliate Igenia has been doing it there oh, for right? quite, quite a while. Oh. Yeah, Just yeah. Three me sold in France right in the as well. Yeah, so uh, people are very very confused about the law, um, but still concerned about it as well because it carries a. Um, uh, 15,000 euro fine and one year in prison. So, uh, vive la France. <laughs> that's quite substantial. <laughs> Yikes, that's quite substantial. You wouldn't be quite careful, would you? <laughs> you're just spitting in a tube and suddenly you're, uh, yeah, you're, suddenly you're in prison. Oh, sorry. sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, have you been to New Zealand? I haven't been to New Zealand. I uh, went to Australia and lots of my friends who are Kiwi said, why haven't you gone to New Zealand? <laughs> uh, and I spoke with people in New Zealand, in, sorry, in you know, Australia, we are different to Australia, who were New Zealand, right? who were from New Zealand. Uh, and you're right, it's not a context I've mentioned. I do apologise. Um, but yes, yeah, so I, I would wish to know more about that. What do you, what's your sense because, of it in New Zealand? Uh, yeah, because we've got, we've got a lot of pioneer families as well. And then our indigenous people, so the Maori, are, are very closely related to Hawaiians. Mm -hmm. So their ethnicity comes up as Polynesian, and there's a lot of really mixed families in New Zealand. So it's one, it's one country that has really interbred, if you like, yeah. between their... Yeah. In fact, you know, they say there's no full-blood Maoris left because it is very, has become very interbred. Yeah. You know, it is much more common, having lived in several countries, in New Zealand, I know it's my home and everything, but it's, it's just normal to have mixed, mixed families and no one thinks anything of it. It's, it's 
Yeah, so Donna, Donna's doing things. doing the general thing that a New Zealand person would say, which is basically they're better than the Australians. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, essentially, they're better <laughs> because of the ways in which the indigenous peoples have become much more uh, part of the community in all kinds of ways, right? Mm. And I, yeah, that's my understanding, but I just haven't been there. But and I, my understanding of this is from people who. Uh, um, New Zealand heritage in the, Australia. So just say say so <laughs> we've been doing this better. One of my favourite things is talking to Australians about Europe, and particularly about European uh, family history and how uh, and English family history in particular, British family history, excuse me, in particular. Uh, and they were quite rude about British families and <laughs> historians. They were like, oh yeah, they're 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 not very interested in stuff. They're just they're, all they want to do is go back you know, as many generations as they can. They're just interested in. Um, in their little trees, they're not interested in uh, social issues like uh, immigration. Not interested. They were very, very rude. They, they, but they very, very clearly thought they were doing something different. That they had a different approach to family history, similarly in the states. Uh, and actually, I, yeah, there's a kind of clear sense that even with the kind of globalized ability of you to talk to someone in uh, in New Zealand or in Japan or in Argentina uh, using the various social networks. Uh, despite that, there's still this clear kind of sense that there's a, there's a local culture and there's a local way of doing this and a local way of, of approaching this. Um, I don't know, so I talked about genealogical tourism, which is something that really I've only just discovered in the last year or so by talking to Australians. Um, have you guys been abroad and done genealogy? Have you, give me a, has anyone oh, ever yes. been, and have you, right, so some people have. Have you done that as your primary focus for your visit abroad? Or was it something you happened to do because you were in Ireland or you were in uh, Germany or whatever? 50-50. 50 So, but mm. would, yeah. How comfortable are you saying that it's, you weren't doing it? <laughs> I, I was going to go on a trip, but I definitely went on it because I knew I could. Absolutely. So there's, it kind of it adds to it, right? Yeah. So most people I spoke with in, uh, in, in Australia and <laughs> the States had made a trip to Europe intentionally to do, to do uh, genealogy. And, and then quite a lot of them then had done other trips where they'd done some on the side. But most of them had a kind of primary, fu primary objective to do, to do family history stuff. And the idea that, that concept of, of, of genealogical tourism is really interesting to me. The idea that you were kind of, you know, that being in a place is important as much as... And this wasn't... They weren't just going to the records offices. They were going to the place and they were going to... Um, and it does mean that Europe, in Europe we're much more... We, compared to them... Uh, we feel much more at the centre of things because you know, uh, my, my, my friends in Holland were like, well, my family's lived here for a generation, so I don't have to do much of this DNA stuff. They were very clear that there was a kind of clear link with the, with the, um, with the nation, with the, with the country they were in, whereas if you're from a, a settler society, there must be, I think, a kind of sense that you, 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 uh, you need to go back and, and inhabit that space. Debbie. Is it mostly family history societies you're talking to? From family history societies you're talking to? Like to it's be really honest, you're yeah. You're getting a, the, the bigger picture with all these new people who are testing who aren't doing the. Yeah, and so the art. So yeah, sorry, I should I should have mentioned that. So mainly, why? Yeah. So the one of the reasons I'm so um, positive about family history societies is that I've spent so much time working with them, and they've been so generous and, and wonderful about opening up space and um, uh, time and giving all kinds of things back. It's been amazing. Um, what a great set of folk. Um, I would want to go and talk with the people who aren't involved in that way, but I, there is just no way of organising that. I don't know how you would do it mm -hmm. unless you're the company, and that and that becomes quite complicated. Mm -hmm. uh, so I suspect that if I'm ancestry or family tree or whomever, they're looking to do some form of, of research, uh, but then getting past data protection, getting in, interested in the ethical issues. I don't know how you would do that really. Uh, in a specific way like the questions we were talking because we were talking with people who had come voluntarily who were quite happy to talk um, and who were uh, who had been given a lot of assurance about what was going to happen with the data um, and, and I said do not give me you know chapter and verse on your centre organs or, or the, I don't want to know that stuff because that's yours um, so I don't know how uh, you would do the research on the people who don't come to these things I have thought about it quite carefully um, and about just I mean I guess Using social media is one way of getting to a, a group, to groups who are just engaging on a less sort of uh, day, less um, committed way. But then you've got you've got to make choices about who you're talking to, right? And, that, and it's just difficult, really. So yeah, all, the, a lot of this data is very skewed because it is people who are already self who are already interested and committed to this. Um, but I don't think there's any other way of doing it. But I could, but I can really find out without having an army of research systems who are going to farm stuff from Twitter and farm stuff on Facebook and just you know, do that really. You could do that, you could do that, but that would be a bit dull. I'm oh, okay. surprised I did a presentation with um, Living DNA mm -hmm. and they had a stat in their talk that only 11% of their customer base were genealogists. 
Well, it makes sense, right? I mean, if you've got... I suppose because the test is not, doesn't have a genealogical application at the moment because they've only just started yeah, yeah, yeah. matching. But it also makes sense just in terms of sheer numbers, right? Yeah. So Ancestry, you'll, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, which I probably am. Ancestry have about 3 million subscribers to, their, to the rest of their stuff. And they've got 15 million people in their database. So 12 million people <laughs> are not genealogists by that token, right? So you've got an enormous amount of people in this database who are not genealogists. Um, who, are, who are involved in your world, and you have to welcome them somehow, but who are not doing trees, who are not going to meetings, who are not talking to folk, who are not on, wet, on social media sites, who are just doing it because it's you know, something they got for Christmas. Um, and you're using them, right? Because you're using their database, and it's, and it's sharpening your results. So they are useful to you, um, and it's giving you better data, and it's giving you crisper, clearer data, and that's good. So they are good people for being there, <laughs> but at the same time, I can see absolutely how frustrating it must be <laughs> to, to a gap come up again and again against people who have just got nothing in their, in their, um, on, their on their profile at all. But yeah, 11% makes about sense, that makes sense. Carl, sure. hi. Um, I have visibility of, of a number of East Asian data sets, primarily Japanese and Chinese, and I do see what you're saying with regards to the, the you know, definitive ancient information but what I have noticed is there are a considerable number of adoptees, primarily mm, Korean, yeah. and there's quite a lot of those data sets, and they're massively keen to find out absolutely. who their parents are. And what does tend to happen, and another thing for the, for the political, I mean, Japan and Korea are very similar to Ireland and Britain historically. There's been interplay for millennia, mm -hmm. and they are quite closely related. So they get data back to say that they're significantly Japanese and vice versa. <laughs> yeah. But in terms of penetration of direct-to-consumer testing in East Asia, have you observed anything with WeGene taking any market share or breaking down this barrier to testing? Um, first off, yeah, the well, adoptees are the lar largely where that, this is, uh, adult, in the States as well, that's where this, that's where this um, is being done with people of East Asian heritage a lot. Um, Although there's also a counter kind of argument about Asian American identity being kind of worrying because people have got comfortable with the idea of Asian American, then it gets broken down into these various different ways or less Asian American than they were expecting. Um, uh, so there's that. Uh, in terms of the director to consumer, not from the people I was talking about, but they were largely in Seoul and they were or in Busan and they were largely. Uh, oldest old school uh, genealogists uh, essentially they were again because of the language issue I was mainly going to uh, places that had a decent organization already and so I was basically looking for people who would talk to me and um, so uh, it, the information they were giving me was what they were thinking about how things were so yeah to my mind they're probably not seeing the whole picture it's clearly right area but like um, how you make the growth happen it was a Japanese testing company, I can't remember the name offhand, but I think it's mostly focusing on health. Yeah, there is some Japanese testing for health. And, and, but Japanese society, and this is very broad, does, te does seem to not be particularly bothered about DNA testing for anything, really. Uh, uh, and a, there is a historical issue associated with that, absolutely. Um, and an ethnicity issue. Uh, kind of thing. We have a question here. Yes. Hey. Um, Whenever we were speaking earlier about like some people don't want to do their tests because um, like um, like the government or third parties are going to harvest their information um, and it brings up like legal and ethical issues and things. Whenever like I hear people talking about that, I'm sort of like like you need to use responsibility for your actions because if governments and third parties are not going to do it through um, genealogical sites. They're going to find it another way to do it anyway because of all the <laughs> revolutions. That's a very cynical way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so if we go back to this guy here, the idea of public good, I think uh, this is a really fascinating idea that he's sort of, he's concerned about uh, the shift from using public resources, so using uh, archives of all kinds, public records of all kinds, into something which is private uh, and, com and business and commodity and, and, and enterprise. And those movements, I think, are really uh, are worrying. Um, and the kind of fact that you're... Ne that, that, that I, I would say that nearly everyone I spoke with had to have their own um, ethical stand on this. Nearly everyone has a thought about it. So you go from just toiling away in the archive 
going to the local history society, going to your thing, and that's, yeah, that's all you have. So suddenly having to think about whether you're comfortable with your data being used in this way. So you're right, it is a personal thing, because you have to say, right, well, I spit in a shoe, I do that. But uh, quite a lot of the, and WA is a lot better than I do, quite a lot of the uh, privacy information around d DNA information has changed over the last three or four years, um, and I'm not sure how well-informed people who use these services necessarily are about that. Um, so, for instance, when uh, it was formerly the case that you would sign off a privacy thing for, for Ancestry uh, until about three years ago, um, that would essentially give them leave to use your DNA in all kinds of ways that they would wish for ever, uh, in any way, in any form they would like to. And I've got these great quotes from it on, on another talk where it's just like, in any form that they wish, in any, in any way, around the world, forever, in perpetuity, royalty free. This is terrifying <laughs> <laughs> what, you're giving, what you're giving to this company. Now you sign an informed consent, um, which means that you're comfortable with your data being used in their experiments, essentially, and you're all part of a massive experiment going on right now. D Ancestry are trying to work out how to use their, their, all this data they've got, not just to create better drugs, or just some drugs, but also how they can use it from a scientific point of view, and they're publishing papers uh, trying to read this data. So you become... When you were formerly using the Ancestry sites up until about 2012, and you were just using their, their census information or their uh, BMD information or whatever you were using, you were, the agency was with you. You were taking the information out. Now, you are giving them information which is being used. Um, and that is good and bad, and you all have to make your decision about that. But I'm not certain people who are getting it for Christmas and sticking it in their mouth and sending it off are necessarily reading all the privacy stuff or thinking through the bioethic issues or whatever. I, don't, I just don't know, really. I think there's yeah. a lot of confusion with the legal language. Absolutely. Because that wordage that they originally had, um, it was actually a lawyer in America who was drumming up a lot of scare stories <coughs> trying to make out that Ancestry could do whatever they wanted with your data. But in fact, that, all that, um, that verbiage indicated was that you had to... If, if your ancestry are going to give you your results, they have to have the right. Oh no! To be absolutely, able to use absolutely. It. So people, it was actually a misinterpretation of the language, no, no, totally. and they, they change it to clarify. They change it to clarify, but and they also change it. You still do have to cite if you want to have your results. You do research. It's a separate, it's a separate consent thing, process. Yeah. And you now and you say that you're in, yeah, it's informed yeah. consent, so, right? So I you're mean, basically the only, your data is only used you know, to give you your results yeah. and to um, improve the product. It's yeah, not absolutely. used externally without your consent. Yeah. But. You go, absolutely, in theory. <laughs> in theory, but also absolutely, and it goes back to the, it's an individual choice. Yes, absolutely, and you sign the informed consent thing because you know who cares, uh, um, or who reads the privacy stuff, or who does. You know, yeah, you're absolutely right. To the letter of the law, it, uh, in black and white, it's fine. But whether that's actually there is an opt-in at the There is. There is a specific opt-in, and you can yeah, opt yeah. out. Yeah. For yeah. medical yeah. research. Yeah. 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 But thing, also the medical, well, sorry, yeah. the medical research, it does say medical research. It's saying scientific, uh, scientific, scientific research. Scientific research. Yeah. But, the, but the research, that, but if you could drill down into what they mean by that, it's very complicated what they mean by, by medical research. Yeah. And what medical research they're actually doing is, is also complicated. So um, I'm more cynical than you, Debbie, maybe, but uh, yeah. I just find that talking, well, no, I'm not, not going to more cynical, that's unfair. Reading the data and talking to people, I was, it was not clear to me that people were as informed as all that, and that they were taking their, uh, their individual uh, um, duties. But also, that's one bit, also people were terrified about this, whether they were, or whether they, you know, they were really anxious about this, whether it was true or not. So you're right, there's, there's all kinds of uh, issues around the language and stuff, but people were just really deeply concerned about this issue. W without, because, it, because going back to that Icelandic novel, because there was a, there's suddenly all this stuff and people are suddenly able to start reading it in all kinds of ways and you're like, well, that, what, that was in me? How do I know that? How do I find that? All I did was get a bit of saliva and suddenly you can make all these things. I mean, you can have all these, these links. And it's, that's the kind of, for me, the fascinating thing is it seems so amazing, but it's also terrifying, surely, at the same time. You, know, you look at your, look at your, uh, your data, your, your, your chromosome information and you're like, <laughs> how many numbers? <laughs> and how does that have anything to do with me? I don't know. Anyway, sorry, I'm talking too much. Well, that's great. So the it's other good. thing is, though, that with a lot of these, um, you know, like the Golden State Killer and all these other revelations, DNA only plays a very small part of it. And it's actually the, um, the growth in online genealogy databases and Facebook, and we now live in this big data world, and it's that big data that is actually yeah. um, making all these, uh, making this knowledge accessible. And yeah. without all that other big data, the DNA itself would be completely meaningless. Oh, no, absolutely. No, absolutely. And so there's what very little 
de actual DNA information that's revealed. It's just you're, you match someone. There's, an, there's no, not it's, much It's else algorithmic to a certain extent. Yeah, so what Debbie's saying is that basically loads of the... the the DNA information is not very significant. It's what is then able to be read into it by the data, right? By, by everything else, yeah. Big data. Uh, by yeah. big data. Um, yeah, and so I think that, again, this is a transformation, right? People started off using Ancestry because they liked reading mm. old things on their computer and it was easier than going to, to a library. And suddenly they're having these conversations in their heads about <laughs> big data and whether they're going to be turned into a, you know, and it's, suddenly, it's a shift, right? <laughs> and. The new people who are coming in, that for them, they're, they're approaching it in a different way. But I think oh, older users, people who have been using, uh, who have been family historians for 10, 20 years, this is quite a paradigm shift in their heads to have to have that knowledge, to have to read the, the documentation and go, right, am I comfortable with this being done? And if I'm not, I'm cutting off all this ability to read it, these things. Um, and I think that there's been such a shift. When I started talking to people, people were resistant to this. Family historians are resistant to the to tests. Now, Nearly every family historian has done it because it's kind of there's a proof of concept. People are like, okay, this is fine, and everyone's just dived in, <laughs> um, fine. But there's, that's that's changed the way you do things, mm -hmm. and I think it would be quite rare now to to find a, a relatively serious family historian who didn't have DNA information about themselves. Um, in ten years, that's happened like that, you know, and in ten years, we've gone from not knowing anything about our DNA as a group to knowing significant amounts, and in 10 years' time, who knows what we'll find out. We may well find a cure for cancer. Yay, that'd be amazing. Mm. Uh, but also other things might happen, like Border Patrol might start using this, which is the UK is looking at pretty seriously, and, and they are in the US, or narcotics might be using it to profile. So there's all these unintended consequences, and it, it's about size again, right? You've got 25 million people. You're suddenly able to do things with that data, uh, which you hadn't been able to do when there was only 10,000 people in there, for instance. Um, it becomes it's so manipulable. But my point was as well that um, if there wasn't these steps, I'm sure the government and they find another way of doing it. Well, they yeah. absolutely. You know, <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Um, well, so what's interesting, but, it, but isn't it also fascinating going back to the Golden State Killer and going back to the kind of issues about about that health investigation? That, with respect, a relatively small collection of people family historians have suddenly become really important. <laughs> you know, so Ancestry as an organisation, is, Ancestry is now, has gone from being a little, well not a little bit, a relatively small information company, now being a massive biotech company in like five years. Um, that transformation is quite strange. No one would have predicted this. I'm pretty certain 15 years ago, no one would have said, well the cutting edge work on forensics <laughs> and genetic identity <laughs> is going to be being done by family historians, which it is. <laughs> and isn't that astonishing, right? <laughs> that you are now the kind of, you know, the, the real, the white, uh, white heat of technology is being, is being experimented upon uh, on you guys. Uh, and you're kind of providing all kinds of test cases and ways into this. Absolutely astonishing. Where, you know, I wouldn't have predicted that when I started working on you. Uh, the, the ancestry uh, data has some health informative markers. Mm -hmm. Embedded, they're not reported today, but they could be reported. Well, they, but, well, that, but that's how Ancestry. One of the reasons that Ancestry has grown so fast, so, because yeah, they're not they're not obliged to give a health data. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. But they would have to go through all kinds of legal hoops in order to do that, which is why Twenty Three and Me has grown slower, because they give health, uh, they give health information, and that there is much more much more um, legislation for health. So there's much, le much less about family history associated with DNA, which is why Ancestry has been, been so flexible, been able to just grow as fast as possible, because there's much less legislation. So again, this is a cutting edge thing about data and about information, about how we legislate as a group of people, as a group of countries or whatever, for global data and where it sits and where, it, you know, where, it, where it's being used and who controls it. Um, that's happening very obviously with social media like Facebook and Twitter and those kinds of things, but it's happening with Ancestry as well. And again, you lot, you lot are at the cutting edge of this stuff, which is amazing. Go us. Yeah, yeah don't you? <laughs> <laughs> right, well, uh, we have to call it a day there, thank but you. Uh, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. Thank you, guys. The thank you, everyone. <laughs>